Okay. All right. I think I'll start. We've had a few minutes. Where are we at? Two minutes past. Okay. Um, greetings, everyone. Um, welcome to uh, the Guru Sauvignon Blanc and Rioja tasting. That's that's me. I'm the guru, technically. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Toby. I work with Ray, who you no doubt have seen plenty of over the last couple of years. Um, I'm sort of the silent partner who works closely with Ray. We I work in wine quality. I spend my days um, tasting wine, basically. If you can see, well, I'll show you later, but I, I taste wine day in, day out. I make sure that all the wine that you guys purchase from us tastes great. Um, and it keeps me busy. Um, Certainly, particularly during lockdown when all the wine was being delivered to my, delivered to my house. That was, uh, that was rather amusing. Anyway, I'm getting lost. Um, so that's what I do. I, I also champion education within the business. I, um, for a long time before I worked with Ray and the wine team, I ran our education program that we offer. A lot of the staff obviously come in not knowing much about wine. So my job was to make sure that they're armed with enough knowledge to make them you know, happy in their jobs and you know, knowledge, knowledge is king, of course. Um, I've since handed that on to well, Simon, who's who's here in the background. Maybe Simon can give a whoop on the chat. But um, so uh, anyway, that's that's what that's well why I'm here. <laughs> there he is. Thanks, Simon. Um, so what I thought we'd do today, I was I was given the task of, of doing an educational tasting, and um, you know, you can you can get lost in many rabbit holes, but I thought that I would um, pick topics that hopefully everyone knows a little bit about, or, or certainly for popular wines that we sell, we sell a lot, obviously, of Sauvignon Blanc and a lot of Rioja. So it seems logical to begin with that. Um, I'm going to take you on a flight of three different Sauvignons from different parts of the world, hopefully to educate you on how different Sauvignon Blanc can be. Um, and yeah, see how place um, affects the profile of the Sauvignon Blanc. And then we'll, we've got a little special guest coming in to talk through a flight of Rioja. Um, no doubt you probably guessed who that is by now. Um, so hopefully you all got the email and it, and it said, ideally you'd all have three glasses lined up with three wines poured out. I think it's very important. The, the best way to learn is through your palate. And if you have one after the other, that's that is great, but also I think to have the three wines standing next to each other, you really can taste the difference between all of them. So if you do have enough glasses, and ideally all the same shape and size, I've got these tasting glasses that I use. Um, they're sort of, you know, ideally fluted so you can smell better. Anyway, we'll see. Um, so let's kick off. So, so you've got three wines. Ideally, you give them a bit of a, bit of a swell. Don't spill your wine all over your laptop like I've definitely done in the past and had to have a new laptop but that's another story um but yeah the idea is that if you give it a swirl like this hopefully ray has taught you through this in the crash course tasting if you if you've been on it been on that um but if you give it a whiz like this it'll get the air through it and it really will make the wine sing hopefully so do that with all three glasses um and then what i want you to do is how oh, best to begin this so you've got france You've got Chile and you've got New Zealand represented in front of you. And what I want you to do first is to have a little, have a little sniff of each glass, okay? Uh, don't taste yet, unless, you, well, some of you may already have done that, but I certainly have, but um, have a little sniff and just go along the flight. And if you're up to it, if you feel brave enough, um, chuck in some, some thoughts as to how different you think they smell. So. Or we can, you know, starting with the French one, just get your nose in, give it a whiz. Okay, this should be your sort of benchmark Sauvignon. It's Virgil Sauvignon from the south of France. Um, classic Sauvignon. I wrote myself some notes earlier, but, you know, very fruit forward. Um, nice and apple -y, nice and peachy, perhaps. Okay. <laughs> and then if you particularly noticeable when you go to the second wine, um, if you give it a whiz and have a smell, Hopefully you should notice there's a bit, bit of a difference going on here. Um, if anyone wants to try and pick out any of the profiles that you get, particularly on wine too, from, from Connie. So this is Connie from Kimbao, um, from Chile. I'll go into that into a bit more depth as we taste, 
but um, just just interesting just to taste through the flight as you go. Okay. Peach is a good one. Um, and then jump into number three. And basically, this is just a quick um, you know, opening, opening the batting, if you like, just to see if you can smell the difference. They are they all are very different. Hopefully, you can see that. Um, and the different countries are represented in how they smell. Okay. Any any brave people want to um, well, I see someone saying tomato or tomato leaf. I saw it in a comment then. That's that's not too far off. Um, you know, classically from, from Chile, particularly with wine number two, I pick up things like green bean, um, asparagus, uh, th those sort of things. It's a, it's a very classical Chilean profile that you will see in a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and then if you go into if you go into wine wine number three from Bill and Claudia Small. You'll notice a bit more um, exuberance, exotic. I always look for things like passion fruit on the nose from Kiwi Sauvignon. It, it's particularly famous for it. Okay, so that just gives you a, a, an idea of some differences. I'll talk to you about about why about why they might um, have this profile next. Okay, if you've got any questions, there's a there's a Q and A um, section at the, at the bottom of the screen. Just fire in anything. There's, there's a team of guys behind behind the scenes who will endeavor to answer questions. If not, I will um, fire in the, I will answer the questions when we come to the end of the session. Okay. So, so why number one, if you have a taste. So this, this is Virgil, this is the south of France. For me, this, this is the, if you like, the benchmark of Sauvignon Blanc. I think Virgil makes fantastic quality wine and, and he has uh, several wines at this at this level. Uh, Rosé, uh, one called the Bourette. Um, and, and honestly, I think Virgil just, just really knocks it out of the park at this range. So if you all have a taste, if you haven't already. I think I will spit just for, just for now, maybe not later, but anyway. Um, so for me, wine, wine, wine is, is almost like biting in, into an apple. It makes your mouth water. Um, it's, nice and fruity you know it's it's not overly complex but also i don't think it's supposed to be um it's uh yeah just good honest sauvignon blanc great value for money okay um wine number two i can see quite a lot of chats about about with, with people with opinions i mean it's certainly a polarizing style of wine i mean if you think these you know these three wines they all started out as a, as a bud on a sauvignon blanc vine they all started out the journey in the same place uh, in their in their infancy, but obviously they've they've gone in very different directions. Now, number uh, number two certainly has that grassy green bean asparagus um, profile, which so, I mean I, I can't, I'm with I'm with I can see some polarizing opinions on there, and, and I agree. You know, it's certainly something that you either love or you hate. Personally, I, I love the style of Sauvignon Blanc. Um, it's it's different. It's interest you know not that other seven blocks aren't interesting but but it's just i don't know it, it it offers something different to be honest um so to all of those who are seeing grassy green bean that's what you should find but actually if you taste it um i don't think it quite has this, the same profile so here is when connie has given it a little little bit more exuberance uh, the nose doesn't the palate doesn't quite follow on so have a taste if you if you haven't already See, for me, so this is this is from the Casablanca Valley in Chile. For those of you who know your geography, Chile is a very long, straight country. On one side, you've got the Pacific Ocean with all the cooling air that, that, that will come from that. On the other side, you've got the Andes Mountains, where you get the cool air coming off the mountains. And the Casablanca is sort of trapped right in the middle of that. And it's a little bowl where it's particularly, it's one of the coldest, coolest um, wine regions in Chile. And that contributes, I think, to the more herbaceous, grassy, um, asparagusy profile that, that you might be seeing with it. The palate's more exuberant. Um, you can, whether you agree with me or not, I think it it just gives a little more. I think if it had just had the herbaceous notes from the nose, it might have been a little tough. But but the palate really is 
where it sings and and yeah like when when i was writing a tasting note about this earlier on I'll, i could certainly have plenty to say um yeah lots of different flavor profiles present mm. Good. And those of you who know of Connie, you know Connie's one of our longest standing winemakers. I think she might have even been the first who, who came through the doors way back um, in 2008 when we joined and, and we worked closely with Connie to make sure that this is this is exactly what she's intended. So hopefully you enjoy it. Okay, final wine is, is Bill and Claudia Small, Sylvia Sauvignon Blanc. So it's their premium uh, Sauvignon. I wanted to base, essentially give you the sort of creme de la creme of, of Marlborough Sauvignon and, and a wine that really speaks of where it's from. Um, so Marlborough is the north end of the South Island of New Zealand. Um, it's, now you think, you know, it, it, it is a cool region in, in, in Marlborough, obviously it's got the, it's surrounded by the sea, but um, the exuberance and, the, and the, uh, the power that you, you hopefully will see from this wine actually comes from it's sort of a pocket of sunshine. The, the Maori name for Marlborough is, my notes have left me here, but oh, it's the place with a hole in the clouds is what the Maori translation of, Mor of the Marlborough region is. It's just an absolute sunspot. And, and if you've ever been to that part of the world, you'll, you'll know that the sky is deep blue. And, and that's, I think Mike Patterson has, has I've, I've talked to him about it, and he just says the, the light is amazing in Marlborough. And that's why a lot of all of Marlborough Sauvignon Blancs generally have that slightly bigger, more exotic profile. So, have a taste if you haven't already. <clears throat> so, see my expression, go. So, that, um, you know, that, that Sauvignon Blanc has far more exuberance. You know, you look for, <clears throat> excuse me, gosh, passion fruit, um, peachy. Yeah, um, it's just just really generous as a style. And, and obviously this one is, is no exception um, in terms of, uh, of its profile. Um, hopefully you all know what this one is. I'd be intrigued to know which you prefer out of these three? I think they all they all offer something different, but they all do have a have a common theme in that they're all crisp, they're all refreshing. They they offer something different. You know, Virgil's wine, in terms of how to you know where to place it or where, you know where to 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 drink it. Um, this for me is. No, perfect with some sunshine outside. I don't. I don't think it. Uh, you no, know, need, needs too much food matching or anything like that. It's just a wonderful summer quaffer. Uh, the, the second one, I think, yeah, certainly a polarizing style. Don't get me wrong. Um, uh, people, you know, I can see lots of comments coming in where people aren't sure about it. But really, I think you know, if you if you match this with, you know, if you're picking up green bean asparagus, you know, this time of year, grill some asparagus and have this. I think it would be, be wonderful, to be honest. Um, and I think I've seen some comments about it that's saying it's the most interesting wine, uh, or they were certainly interested in white wine by it. So, which I, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, this, this wine and South African Sauvignon Blanc also have this similar profile. And for me, it's something that I, I always look for. Um, Sylvia, hopefully, speaks for itself in terms of its exuberance. Um, okay, um, I think for me, well, well I, again, I think I've said it already, but what I find so fascinating is that this is all the same grape. It all started as, this, it all started as the same thing, but actually they do offer lots of difference, which is always, you know, which is fascinating. I think, you know, the, the world of wine, you know, you, you, you can get stuck and, and, you know, I think I only drink this certain style of wine, but you know, actually, don't go, don't defer, don't um, uh, go too far from what you know. If you always drink, let's say, a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, maybe these these other two aren't too far out of your comfort zone. Um, okay. Um, do you have any other Q and A questions about these wines? 
um, before we move on. Hopefully not. Okay. Seem to be racing through things here. Okay, well, what we're going to do next um, is we're going to discuss the Rioja flights with you. Now, we have a special guest joining us in the shape of, of Carlos Rodriguez. Now, I, I appreciate you've got three samples in front of you already, but potentially you might have to just spend a couple of minutes now either dispatching them in any way you see fit while you re-pour the next round of glasses. And hopefully, Carlos is on screen now for you all. Hello, Toby. Hello, Hi, all. Carlos. Hi, Carlos. Good to see you. Um, good to see you too. Uh, what, what I'll do, perhaps um, a good thing. So Carlos is, is what Carlos is now going to talk you through Rioja, some of the Rioja uh, wine laws and, and uh, some of the rules and regulations that say about, about Rioja. That doesn't sound very sexy at all, but Carlos will, will do it much better than me. Um, and in that time, if you can get your flight poured out, and then after Carlos has done that, we'll do the tasting flight together. Does that sound about right for you, Carlos? Yes, yes. Okay, Perfect. cool. I'm going to pour mine away. You you carry on, Carlos. The stage okay. is here. Thank you, Toby. Thanks so much for the opportunity with being with all of you and to have the opportunity to talk about Rioja. Uh, I, for what I've noticed since 11, 12 years ago that I'm producing wines for Naked Wines that I'm part of the Naked Wines family, there is, it's quite confusing for many people, Rioja, the region and the wine. So in some way it's confusing uh, even for us because it's, it's the region with name of wine. But to make it clear, Rioja is a geographical region in the central north of Spain. It's not such a big region. It goes from northwest to southeast 120 kilometers, no more than that. And from south to north, 30 kilometers. So it's not such a big region, but it's a region where everything moves around the wine. Uh, we have here 65,000 hectares that translated to wine bottles. Uh, we are talking about almost 400 million bottles every year, every year. 90% um, of these bottles are red, but 10% or well, around 10% are white. Please don't consider these numbers as exactly numbers. I'm just making round numbers to make it easier, okay? Uh, as the region is an appellation, we have a lot of rules. Uh, I, uh, I imagine you know that there's probably the big difference between the New World and European wines, the rules. I will give you just a few tips about our rules. Uh, grape varieties, there are limits. We cannot plant all the grape varieties uh, as a free choice. Uh, our main, uh, our main red grape is Tempranillo, 80%, around, percent, around of the red uh, surface of vineyards. And uh, in white, uh, Macabeo is more or less the same percent, around 80%. But in the 20% of whites and the 20% of reds, we have all the grape varieties. Talking about red, we have Grenache and we have Graziano, for example. We have also Carignan. Um, talking about whites, one very interesting grape variety that we have is white tempranillo. White tempranillo is a natural mutation coming from regular tempranillo. It's, it's a natural mutation that was uh, founded in the year 86. And this is something very, very interesting on the science point of view, because it's the first time in the history that humans, we know exactly when and where a great variety has been born. This is something that uh, uh, we have an idea, but never, uh, for most of the great varieties, we never know exactly where and when it happened. And it's particularly interesting with this white tempranillo. Another rule is that the production is limit. And it's limit in the sense of the surface that we can plant because we have the planting rights. 
So we cannot plan uh, as much as we want. Uh, we are limited on the gel, the hectare, and we are also limited in the transformation between kilograms of grapes and uh, liquid wine. So these limits are more or less on the gel, 65 tons per hectare, what is a quite low uh, production, comparing with other wine appellations, and in terms of transformation, 70%. So one kilogram of grapes uh, it produce seven, 70 centiliters of wine, okay? And this is controlled with every track during harvest. Every track during harvest must go to the weight station and it's identified with a chip car that identifies the producer, the owner of the vineyard, um, also the, the surface and grape variety related with, this, uh, with these grapes. In the winery, every month, we must give the control organization every single movement of wine in the winery. So all the liters that we keep in tank, all the liters that we keep in bottles, and all the liters that we keep in bottle. Um, we are, at the end, we are very controlled. Um, it's, it's some, for producers, this is sometimes a little bit hard in the sense that a lot of bureaucratic paperwork, but for consumers, I think it's a warranty, a quality warranty. Um, just to give you a couple of curiosities, Rioja is the wine region with higher quantity of oak barrels in the world. Just now, out of the window here, we have 1,200,000 barrels. Um, a website that I would like to give you in case that you are interested in learning more about Rioja is the website of the Control Board Organization of Rioja. It's www. Uh, www, sorry, riojawine.com. I think easy. part of the, um, I've, I've shared that link with Simon, so hopefully Simon now can put the link into the chat so everyone will be able to... to okay, perfect, perfect. Reference. Thank you, Toby. Everything is in English, um, so who, who, who is interested in getting more info, you, you can do it there. Um, about, the, about the wines that we are going to... To, to, we have today for tasting, we have three wines. Uh, one is Trigales. Uh, Trigales is not properly a Rioja wine, as it is a declassified wine. It's a wine that we voluntarily declassified from Rioja, but uh, is the style of young Rioja red. The second wine could be uh, a Rioja Crianza, Morum Crianza, and the third is Morum Reserva, okay? So these are three different styles of wine according to the aging times. Uh, I would like to explain you a little bit why the prices are different. Because I saw, for example, uh, about the Sauvignon Blanc, I saw a question uh, somebody asking why the difference of four pounds between uh, the three different uh, Sauvignon uh, wines. Mm -hmm. okay. The difference in, the, in of pricing in these wines that they go from seven ninety nine in Chigales to nine ninety nine in Crianta and eleven ninety nine in Reserva, the difference are related with the grape quality. The grape quality that uh, we must produce in the vineyards. Is different if the goal is to make a young wine or if the goal is to make a reserve wine, to make the most different, differentiated examples. In two main aspects, the gel, because the gel it gives you the concentration. So higher is the gel, lower is the concentration of the berries, and lower is going to be the concentration of the wine too. And for aging in barrel, we need more concentrated wines. And the second aspect is the maturation of the grapes. To keep the wine aging in barrel, we need perfectly mature, perfectly ripe grapes. And this depends on the microclimatic conditions. 
altitude, soil, and exposition of the vineyard. Okay, so one point is the grape quality. Another point are the wine making methods. Oak barrels, they cost between 400 to 1,000 pounds each barrel. And with one barrel, uh, the volume is related, uh, is, the same, is the volume to make 300 bottles. So you can make numbers. And timing, aging timing is also a cost, it's a financial cost. So these are the reasons for having more expensive wines when you go to more aged wines and have a, having cheaper wines when you go to younger wines. It's not, uh, it's not uh, just the wine quality because it's not worse or better because this depends to each personal palate. You know, it's related with the cost that this is in my humble opinion uh, with the experience of working in Naked, as I told you since 12 years ago, is one of the biggest advantage of Naked Wines model. In the Naked Wine model, we don't need producer, we don't need to, to have commercial spends and uh, all the prices are just related with production cost. And this is uh, what at the end, what you get in the, in the wine. There was a good question in, in the chat there, Carlos. Um, someone mm. asking about, about the barrels and, and you say they cost between 400 and a thousand pounds each. You can reuse the barrels though, yes? You know, yes. they have a yes. certain number of years. Yes, 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 absolutely. Uh, this is this is a winemaker choice. How long do you reuse the barrels? Uh, it depends also uh, the wine that you put into the barrels. In some way, there are some wines that they uh, damage more the barrels, or some others that they damage less the barrels. Uh, to give you a general idea for good value wines, for this style of wines, what I'm doing is between one year and five years. This is what I'm doing. So uh, more than that, more than that, uh, the barrel becomes a container, but the interaction that it has with the wine is really, really limited. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, I don't know if I answer well the question or do you think it's something else to give a clear fact? No, I think that's right. You know, you know a, a year one barrel will, it's like if you're making tea, right? If, you, if you're making a cup of tea and you have your tea bag, you know, first, if you have the same tea bag for the first cup, one first cup of tea will obviously extract lots of color and that, and that um, you know, it would be a good cup of tea if you like. Then no. if you the same tea bag for the second cup and for the third, you know, the amount of uh, flavor that you'll get out of that tea bag will be mm. much less. And if you, if you apply that to the each year a barrel is used. It's a good example uh, because uh, there's a kind of uh, in, in a kind of infusion in the, the flavor that the oak gives to the wine mm. for the contact between oak and wine. But there's also another situation that happened that uh, the wine into the barrel uh, has a micro oxygenation. So uh, the barrel lets breath in the, the wine. Uh, older is the barrel, uh, less oxygen uh, exchange you have. So uh, in some way, it's, it's, it's both, these are the, both the, the two situations that wine makers we need to manage when we are aging wine in bar. Okay. okay. Um, with these styles, that the young is an unoki red, uh, Crianza is a wine aged for minimal two years, one of them in barrel. And Reserva is a wine aged for three years with minimum one year in barrel and six months in bottle. So these are the minimums. You can do uh, longer if you, if you decide yourself if you want. Uh, what you could expect? What are the what are what you could expect in the glass? Okay. So for me, uh, 
these three wines really represent what you could expect in, in, in the different styles of Rioja. With the Trigales, a young red from Rioja, we find fresh and fruity style. Uh, red fruit, some black fruit, and in the mouth, it is fresh. It's quite vibrant, you know. It's still not. It, it doesn't has still the smoothness, um, the velvety palate that you we will find in the in the other wines more age. In the crianza, that is probably the balance in the middle. There is a balance. You will listen to me to say balance many times talking about crianza. It's a balance between oak and fruit in the nose. The fruit is not fresh, fresh as it was in the jam. It's more mature, it's more yummy. Was your Crianza aged in the, according to the minimum rules or did you leave it for some longer time? We keep it in, we keep it in, in barrel between 12 months and 15 months, depending each year, uh, each year uh, vintage could be a little bit different. Okay. So, depending if the if if we consider if, if we need a little bit more of aging or a little bit less, but between twelve months and fifteen months, okay. I'm I'm not interested in keeping it longer because uh, as probably you know all of you who, who know my wines. You have noticed that I'm I'm not an oak lover. I'm trying to keep my wines in a balance between the fruit and the oak. Um, for me, the perfect situation it could be when you use the oak, but it's difficult to notice it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's a pity, in my opinion, my humble opinion as wine maker. It's a pity uh, when we stay the full year taking care of the vineyards, the full year taking care of the grapes. And we hide all the fruit with the oak. Yeah. So uh, I'm a I'm a wine maker, not an oak tea maker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with the with the Trigales, with the with um, wine four, what the first one in this flight? Did, what's the oak um, for this one? Do you the minimum? The Trigales yeah. has not has not been aged in oak bar. Okay. Uh, this is an interesting question <laughs> because. In Rioja, the only oak that we are allowed to use is barrel. We are not allowed to use staves or chips in Rioja, okay? But in table wine, we are allowed to use staves or chips. And Trigales is a declassified wine that uh, I choose myself uh, some wine and I declassify it. It's a way to make it cheaper. Uh, it's just because of bureaucratic paperwork. Uh, this was an idea we had several years ago with the goal of making the best value possible. I said to make a wine for every day and for every pocket. That was that was the idea with you guys. Um, as, as what make us popular in Rioja wines uh, are the 80 you know, wines, uh, we decided that this wine to give it a hint of oak and it has a little bit of oak, but this, in this wine are staves that we can use that. And for so, those and for those who don't know what staves or, or chips are, um, do, you, do you want me to explain or do you want to go for it, Carl? With the, with the staves, uh, we get a little bit of the vanilla and cinnamon to balance with the fresh fruit, but we don't get any uh, of the oxygen exchange that gives the maturation of the wine. And so we give, it, we give it down with a hint of oak. And, and quite simply, staves are planks of wood that you put into a, a steel tank or a concrete tank or, or whatever. Exactly, exactly. And you can get different types of you know, um, flavor profiles from this. It's like a menu you can choose. Is this right? You can get yeah, staves exactly. that will give you chocolate, exactly. vanilla, mocha. Nutmeg. Yeah, exactly. We can, 
we can use, uh, so in some way, it is easier to find uh, the oak style than with the barrels, mm -hmm. because with the barrels is a traditional, artisanal uh, when making concept, with the steps is more technological. Yeah. So it's easier. It's easier to measure uh, the quantity of oak that you want to give. Um, and it is faster also because we do it in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So these are the reasons for getting uh, the final cost, production cost. Mm -hmm. so, uh, but this wine was born with this idea to get the, 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 the same quality of the grape and wine of Rioja, but uh, working out of the Rioja rules uh, to make the best value possible. That, that was the idea. Perfect. And the third wine, Reserva. Here we go to an upper step in the concept that we, we in, on the same direction we went with the Crianza. So again, the balance between the oak and the fruit, but the fruit in this wine is totally mature fruit. Uh, it's not fresh fruit. It's jammy fruit, uh, dry fruit. For me, it remembers one food, one uh, typical English food that remembers me is the Christmas pudding. Nice. So the increased time in oak will give more of an oaky profile, do you think? Is that is that what people should be looking for? Or is it is it the is it the fruit that really changes with the age, do you think? It's, uh, it's the fruit that changes. It's the fruit that changes. Here, the important, for, for my personal opinion, the, the important thing in the relation between wine and oak, mm -hmm. that is an unseen relation. Since a lot of years, a uh, thousand of years, um, and that in my humble opinion is a perfect relation. So top wines of the world, they are aging oak, always in every single corner of the world. But the perfect relation is uh, when the oak flavors doesn't hide the fruity flavors. Mm -hmm. And I'm more interested in the evolution, in the microsigenation. So these mature flav fruity flavors that go more to the jammy character and the dried uh, or this Christmas pudding that we talk it mm -hmm. are more related with the evolution of the fruit flavors mm -hmm. to this aspect thanks to the oxygenation that it gets into the bar. And you, and you were talking about the, the quality of the grapes um, at the beginning of this and, and perhaps just touch on that again here because I think you need to have good quality grapes for the aging to, to work properly. Because uh, Depending, uh, the, if the grapes, they are not well mature. Mm -hmm. That uh, If you remember, I, I, I talked to you about two points. The yield that is related with the concentration and the maturation that is related with the microclimatic mm -hmm. conditions of the parcel, of the, of the vineyard. Mm -hmm. So if the grapes, they are not well mature, they, uh, with this oxygenation in the barrel, they will not have a good evolution. Mm -hmm. They will they will get uh, we will find uh, green carter, we will find more uh, like green pepper carter. Uh, I'm not uh, trying to I'm just making an example, not talking bad about any kind of wine or any kind of grape variety. The typical green carter of Cabernet Franc, for example, that is not it's not natural for a Tempranillo, but could be natural for a not ripe enough Tempranillo, okay? So this could be, if the grapes, they are not ripe enough, mm -hmm. the evolution will not be good. Ah, on the same direction, if the yield is too big, concentration will not be enough to, uh, the, the, to the get yield. the balance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, the terms of, in terms of the yield. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that that's the quality that we need. 
Uh, another important aspect about the Reserva is that uh, with the longer aging in, in the barrel, on the mouth, we get more, much more smoothness and more velvety character. Mm -hmm. So this is the natural evolution of the wine in barrel. Uh, the same concept for the aging in bottle, because mm -hmm. these are wines that you can keep for longer in the bottle. If, if always thinking in keeping them in good conditions, you know, uh, because wine, if it's in, in too high temperatures, it's softer, mm -hmm. um, you know, no. And uh, no, no sunlight, you got to keep it in the dark and you keep it keep yeah. on the side. Yeah, that's, that, that's the point. Uh, wines that, uh, this, this, this remembers me a situation that uh, have, I've talked uh, doing this too with some people uh, face to face. Uh, I'm, I'm always myself answering the post. Uh, and for me, this is a very, very interesting uh, aspect of, again, Naked Wines more. How because many posts do you get to have to answer every week or every day? Oh, I honestly, I do once a week. Uh, I organize on this way mm -hmm. um, between uh, around 150. Oh. So 100 is low quantity and 200 is quite a big quantity for one week. 150 or something like this, I think. But I don't pay so much attention to the quantity. I just start with the, with one and <laughs> I go on with all of them. <laughs> But for me, the idea is that uh, with this system that consumers, you can post and give us, producers, your opinion, we learn a lot. We learn a lot. You are helping me with all your posts. You are helping me to improve the quality of my wines. But uh, a good option, in my humble opinion, it would be if you use this, uh, sh this um, short, this uh, small, distance between producers and consumers if you use yourself angels in the opposite direction just for asking things mm -hmm. you have uh, the possibility of asking us whatever you want this is something that will never happen to you in a restaurant will mm -hmm. never happen to you in in a shop in the street will never happen to you in the supermarket mm -hmm. you will never find in these places the winemaker for answering you your questions so please don't hesitate to ask whatever you want. Mm, there are no stupid questions. Probably could be a stupid answers, but this is my problem. But mm. feel free for asking whatever you want, really. I think, you know, it's certainly a, a rare um, setup and that you can, as a consumer, talk directly to you, Carlos. I mean, I remember my when I first joined Naked Wines, my, my sister, she, she reviewed a wine, I, you know, I, I got her to join and she reviewed a wine and within a, a few hours, she'd had a reply. And I think from then she was sold. She understood the, the model perfectly at that mm. point. Um, no, it's, 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 it's an opportunity that uh, we must say, say mm. it for that. Um, just, to, just to end about talk, talking about these wines, of course that there are wines that different ones. So it is the beautiful thing of Rioja is that we can make different wines in the same uh, wine region, wine region, wine appellation. No, we we can make different wines. Wines for different palates, of course. Each personal palate is different, mm -hmm. but there are also wines for different moments. You know, there are uh, for me, for example. Uh, the longest aged uh, wines have to drink more relaxed, uh, more slow drinking with food. On the opposite, uh, on, on the other hand, young uh, Rioja Reds, for me, are more kind of casual drinking, you know. I'm thinking on Trigales, Trigales, I don't need any special food. I don't need any special guest. I don't need any special occasion to open a bottle of Trigales. Mm -hmm. So just to give you an uh, anecdote, an ex uh, situation that happened here half an hour ago, 
my wife arrived at home that she, she was with the kids in the swimming pool and she wanted to have a glass of wine. She drank a glass of two gallons. Yeah. You know, uh, supposedly the other two are better because they are more expensive. You know? But it's simple, easy, a wine that you can enjoy. Perfect. And you can afford. Yeah. That, that's the idea. Wines for different food also. You know, and this, uh, we could be talking two hours about food paintings, but food paintings is very simple. Food paintings is what you prefer. Your personal preference are the food. Is, this is the perfect food painting, your mm -hmm. personal preference. I only give you one rule to all of you. Be open-minded and experience yourself. This is the only rule for me. Um, be open-minded also with the temperatures. It's incredible how temperature change a wine. So now that outside is 40 degrees, I prefer to drink uh, chill. Um, to drink chill is much better a young red than an aged red. So the Trigal is that you'd have, what, at sort of 10, 10 or 11 degrees? Something you like can that. drink it perfectly, yeah. perfectly. And there are, sometimes you can drink uh, at you want the drink in your mouth to feel it at lower temperature mm -hmm. because it's hot and you want to have it at lower temperature. So you can enjoy the wines in many, many different aspects, many, many different ways. And you've said you said in the past you often it's quite common in Spain to have red wine with lemonade. Is that right? Is a is a sorry, I didn't want it to tell it, but the glass that my wife told. To, uh, took it was to to help with a little bit of coke. <laughs> <laughs> that's very, that's it's very, not, very common, isn't it? It's uh, there's uh, for for me the, the the two fixed rules. One is uh, be open minded. It's no rule. It's not a rule. It's my recommendation. Be mm -hmm. open minded. But uh, a rule is to enjoy. Mm -hmm. So why is to enjoy? It? It's not to follow the rules that the winemaker tells you or to follow the rules that the uh, journalist in I don't know what review tells to you. Mm -hmm. uh, wine is a way to enjoy. So if you enjoy drinking it chilled, drink it chilled. If you enjoy drinking it with lemonade or with Coke, why don't you try it with Coke or with lemonade? Mm -hmm. There are some times that you prefer, you following the same example, that there are some times that I prefer to have something fresher at lower temperature, no? Mm -hmm. But there are some times that I want to have a longer drink. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not the same. You, you, we, we don't drink at the same speed and expedit mm -hmm. than a beer, no? Because yeah. the alcohol level is different and uh, we cannot drink at the same speed, no? The, 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 the two different drinks. It happened the same with the wine. If you, if you, if you want to add lemonade, why not? If you want to add coke, why not? Spare it yourself. That's my yeah. only recommendation. Cool. So you said you said the first wine, you know, is is, is you know, we explained how to drink it. And you said with the reserva is a wine to take your time with and have a meal. What, what about the crianza? What, what about in the middle? For, for that's my opinion, my personal opinion. Yeah. For me, for me, the crianza is the uh, the joker. Okay. <laughs> you can use in different positions. <laughs> so the, uh, the joker in the sense that uh, it could it, it could be on the uh, you could identify it closer to the young or you could identify it closer to the older, mm -hmm. to the reserva. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a table of several peoples that the, some of them they prefer fruity, some of them they prefer more mature, Crianza could suit everybody. Yeah. When you have some doubts about the food pain between young or, or reserva, between younger or older, mm -hmm. Crianza could suit that situation. Uh, for me, this is why I thought to answer you that Crianza is the joker, more or less. It can be, yeah, it can fit many occasions. It could fit many occasions, that idea. Uh, uh, It depends. It depends also, Toby. It depends also about 
how long has been the wine also aged in bottle. Yeah. So, for example, now, now I'm bottling the Crianza 2019. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it's it was bottled uh, during uh, during the last two weeks of May and the first week of June. It was bottled. Uh, uh, Ninety percent of the wines, most of the wines, but okay. one of them, the other. But now we are having 2018. So 2018 has been in the bottle for one year more, and this yep. this makes a difference. So the answer 2018 now is closer to a reserve style than what is the answer 2019 that is probably at this moment closer to a younger style. Okay. And how long would you say, how, how long do each of these have now? Now they're in bottle and on the shelves and hopefully in some baskets. Um, how long would, you, let's say, the Trigales, would you would you drink that within the next few years? or Trigales, Trigales, Trigales is a wine that is not thought to keep in the bottle. It was not born to be aging in the bottle. So in my opinion, it would be better drinking now. Mm -hmm. But now... In terms of red wines, now a one year, one year and a half is more or less the same. No? Uh, Crianza and Reserva, this could be different in depending of each year. Mm -hmm. So there are years that uh, some wines, they age better than others. Mm -hmm. um, this depends on uh, each year weather conditions mm -hmm. mostly. Yep. So, for example, for me, my personal part, at this moment, the best wine in my range for keep aging in the bottle is the Moru Crianza Selección Especial 2017. That's the best wine for aging, no matter, okay. in my opinion. These two wines that we are tasting now, Crianza 2018 and Reserva 2016, you can keep all the two, three, four years without any problem. Yeah. And it depends also on each wine, each each one palate. Yeah. Because they have, I've noticed that uh, I noticed that you in England, uh, in UK, you, there are people that really love edgy brands. Mm -hmm. Probably it's a kind of heritage uh, of a sherry or port palate. Mm -hmm. uh, you appreciate there are some people that they really appreciate long aged brands. Yeah. For for me, the the way to identify the right moment uh, for a, a, when you are aging a wine in your, in your cellar, or this is at least what I do myself, mm -hmm. and I do also with the wines I'm making for naked. I open one bottle with a regularity. For example, mm -hmm. one bottle each three months. Yes, and I try. I have not. I don't have a calendar, but yeah. I do it more or less with regularity. One mm -hmm. bottle each three months, and opening one bottle each three months, you find the point that uh, the wine evolution is sweets better with your palate. Mm -hmm. That 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 the, that the moment to increase the frequency of opening bottles. Yeah, <laughs> that's the moment to to open more yeah. <laughs> more with. <laughs> We all, that, that can change, you know. From you know, six months, the wine will be good, and then it'll dip again for six months, and it'll and it'll vary. It, it just this, depends, this it? is something. This is something that sometimes with some wines it happens also. Yeah. But uh, this is uh, this is very difficult to explain. Uh, on, on for that situations, I don't feel able to give rules. You know, it's. Uh, but uh, in general, the, my recommendation is again to experience yourself, to be open-minded and experience yeah. yourself. Yeah, and I guess the struggle is in, in England, lots of people don't have wine cellars. So, yeah. you know, certainly for me, and I think for a few people here, if it's in the wine rack, I'm, I'm tempted and I have to sort of control myself not to open mm. the bottles. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it, is, uh, is is need a lot of space to keep wine. Um, you know, it's need also a lot of passion. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I've seen one one question on the chat come up a few times is about decanting the wine. Um, you know what 
what's your advice? Do you think all wine, you know, let, let's use these wines as an example. I think probably the Trigullis, I mean, all wine will benefit from decanting. Yes. The air will get through it. It'll open. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, what's your take? It's a, uh, in general, decanting. You don't do anything but the wine. Mm -hmm. So uh, in case of doubt, mm -hmm. the canteen, you give uh, this breath to the wine faster. And uh, this uh, oxygen that the wine gets mm -hmm. in, in the decanting process uh, helps to make the wine more expressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, more expressive, it means that uh, this, here I'm going to try to be a little bit technical, but simple at the same time. The aromatic compounds that they are into the wine, into the liquid, if we want to enjoy them, we need them to arrive to our nose, mm -hmm. to our sense, okay? Mm -hmm. To our smell sense. So they need to become volatile. Because we as we as smell without touching the liquid, mm -hmm. we as smell and we get the volatile compounds that they go out of the wine the liquid, yeah. and they arrive to our nose. These compounds they become volatile, more or less volatile, depending of the temperature and depending of of the oxygen that these molecules they get. Yeah. No? So. Uh, higher temperature, more volatile they are these compounds. This especially benefits to the aged in oak wines. Yeah. For younger reds, for fruity reds, uh, the fruity aromatic compounds, they became volatile at lower temperature, okay? Uh, same situation in the relation of the compo these compounds with the oxygen. Mm -hmm. When these compounds, they get the oxygen, they became more volatile and easier to feel for our nose, for mm -hmm. our uh, smelling sense. Yeah. So uh, this is the reason for the canting. Yeah. You can, for example, keeping the glass, keeping the wine into the glass for, now I have I having these wines here for 40 minutes that we are talking. Mm -hmm their aroma change sure. because the wine gets also the oxygen in the glass so what is here what could be need to experience yourself we need how the evolution how them how the relation between oxygen and wines mm -hmm. oxygen and wine how is the relation depending if you keep just the bottle open Mm -hmm. You have a little bit of oxygen to get into the bottle. You pull, you pull the wine into the glass, and you have more oxygen exchange. Or you decant, and you have even a more oxygen uh, exchange. So there are different options uh, according to the speed of exchange and the level of exchange mm -hmm. between oxygen and the wine. To experience, and if you and if and a good tip is if you don't have a decanter, just pour the wine into a, a jug, a water jug or something, and then pour it back into the bottle, and then you get the same aeration through the wine. If you, that's a, that's is a good possibility. If yeah. you need to, if you need, if you are going to drink the wine mm -hmm. fast, so in the sense, if you have, for example, six people, and you are going to drink the bottle in ten minutes, mm -hmm. it's a perfect solution. Yeah. If you are if you are two people to drink the bottle, I personally recommend you to do it slower. To yeah. do to, to have the, the, the oxygenation of the wine into your glass. Yeah. To do it slower. That's good it, it depends. Uh, so in, in 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 some way, wine accepts much better uh, a slow change than fast change. Mm -hmm. But this is this is a very professional point of view. Yeah, <laughs> you, don't, you don't want to get lost too much, I don't think. Um, 
Okay, um, Carlos, there's a few questions that have come up in the um, Q&A, which I'll just run through. There's a few open ones here. Um, let me just have a quick look. Um, oof, the, the first one, actually, it's probably aimed at me, or maybe Carlos, you can give opinion to. What are your views on adding ice cubes to Sauvignon Blanc? That's from John and Liz. So putting ice in, in wine. What? Well, uh, I mean, for I me, I would say just make sure you put enough ice in your glass. If you just put a couple of ice cubes, the ice will melt and it will dilute the wine. Whereas if you have you know, either a big, big block of ice or, or lots of ice, the ice will stay frozen and you will chill the wine without. Yeah, yeah, I understand. The, the only problem uh, is uh, that when the ice cube melts, yeah, uh, you get water into your wine. Yeah, but this is not such a big problem, you know. You, it's yeah. I don't know. It's it's like when we were talking about the lemonade and the mm -hmm. and the and the wine. No, I, I you made me remember remembering my grandfather. My grandfather used to go in these summer days. It's very usual in Spain uh, to go out in the street to get some uh, some the, the the price that you get. At the evening, no, some fresh air coming mm -hmm. I mean, from the mountains. Uh, it's, it's the expression is to take el, la fresca, el fresco. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the expression in Spain. I remember my my grandfather there always with the rosé, and he used to drink it with lemonade. And he always used to say to me that there are some people that they say that if you if you add lemonade to the wine, you ruin the wine. Mm -hmm. Okay. But he used to to look the in the opposite direction. Yeah. Have, have you tried the lemonade itself? <laughs> yeah. It's much better lemonade. with wine, you know. Yeah. So <laughs> for me, I don't feel I don't feel Taliban increased mm. with this kind of things. So okay. for me, uh, it's a modern to add to add ice cubes into the glass of wine is something modern. I never seen it until two, three, or four years ago. Okay. So it's quite a modern. Uh, fashion. No, no, but yeah. I don't think I don't think this happened anything bad. No, probably, no. probably much better for whites and for rosé than for reds. Okay, good. Um, Carlos, would Rioja from Neil? Would Rioja mostly be a winter wine, or could you should you drink it all year round? For me, for for in the concept of winter wine, I will drink more the Reserva for sure. So if, if I'm thinking me drinking in front of the fire with the dog on my feet, uh, you know, I, 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 I imagine myself drinking the Reserva. Fine. There's quite a lot of questions about Grand Reserva. Carlos, do you do a Grand Reserva? I think we've spoken no. about we've spoken about this in the past. No, not no, Toby. I'm I'm poor. <laughs> <laughs> no, sure. that 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 the answer. I'm poor. Yeah. Grand Reserva. Is uh, just uh, just one second to don't say you anything stupid. Uh, well, aging time. Yeah, exactly. Five, five years. So, isn't it? Five years. Mm -hmm. Two of them in barrel and three in the bottle. Mm -hmm. uh, to keep the wine two years in the barrel. It's not such a big problem because uh, from the barrel you can manage for blending or whatever you want. Mm -hmm. What is a big problem, a big difficult, is to keep the wine into the bottle, bottling it, and to keep the bottles three years. Because that's that, that's really yeah. you you need a, you need a, so you need a lot of uh, financial resource. Mm -hmm. uh, an important, a very, very important part of the price that you pay when you buy a Grand Reserva is related with the financial cost. So if you want me to give you an advice, something that now that there is not so many people listen to us, Toby, <laughs> <laughs> if you keep some years a Crianza or some years a Reserva. For example, the Morum Crianza Selección Especial 2017. If you keep in the bottle aging yourself 
these kind of wines, you don't get something really far away of, of a Grand Reserve. Okay. You are more or less, you are more or less there. It's a, the, the, the problem is related with the mm. uh, financial cost of that one yeah. for me. Okay, good. Thank you, Carlos. Um, there's a question that's coming about the packaging, actually, the tasting packs uh, from Emma. Do the online tasting packaging make any difference to the taste? They all taste fab. I just wondered if they stay fresh after being released from the bottles. So, um, yes, it, they do taste. We, Ray and I meticulously taste um, all of the these uh, sachets when they get they they are produced only a few weeks ago. Um, we taste them versus the bottled wines because you know quality is is Ray and I's number one um, you know worry if you like. And if the wine in any way tastes different, we yeah we 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 act. But the guys who who do do this for us are high tech. It's all all um, they're all filled you know in in uh, atmospheres and and. You know, they're, they're very slick so no they're very very good quality emma so don't worry we, we wouldn't ever you know risk carlos's or anyone's wines no i think i think it's a uh, it's a brilliant system uh, to send samples mm -hmm. um for 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 this kind of events mm -hmm. it's it's a it's a really brilliant invention mm. uh i don't find any problem um I, I, for especially for rats you know when, when i'm you hear me several times saying that for rats or for whites in terms of the ice cube or now mm. with the tasting packaging mm. you know the difference is that uh, with the rats uh, we have uh, a much more stronger wine okay. and much more protected against the excess of oxygen mm -hmm. that is the problem uh, of uh, the, the supposedly problem of the packaging, yeah. especially at the filling moment. No, but for what for what I tried this package, uh, I don't find any problem. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to do one last question. Um, to the final question, I can see Carlos. Do you only drink your own wines, or what else? What other wines do you drink, Carlos? Do you have time to <laughs> say you all of that? Yeah, <laughs> I. Uh, I have my wine in the garage, my personal wines in the garage. Um, actually, at the moment, probably I have more than between 400 and 500 different wines for sure. And is it mainly European wines or do you get wines from all over the world? That, to say the truth, 95% are European wines. Okay. Well, you know, when you come on the wine tours, like, you have an opportunity to taste with the new world winemakers as well, don't you? So. Well, I, uh, uh, I love uh, what uh, what our my colleagues, they are making. So for example, uh, I know the wines uh, about the new, new world, uh, Connie and Bill and Claudia Small, yeah. uh, Sauvignon Blancs, I tasted both of them. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I like them. But uh, for me, in Spain, it's not easy to find that wines. Mm -hmm. um, another point is that probably my palate is more uh, used to the uh, European wines. So for example, mm -hmm. I'm a f quite talking about France and quite uh, focused on Burgundy and Rhone, mm -hmm. especially the northern part of Rhone. Yeah. Um, in Italy, I like a lot the Barolo area, Barolo um, Barbera wines. Lovely. For example, uh, a few months ago, one year ago, more or less, I, I made an exchange with uh, Messier Cordero, yeah. Yeah. Franco, yeah. Serena's father. Yeah. Uh, I sent him some bottles from Spain and he sent me some bottles. That from, sounds like a good deal. I like that. Good one. That, that are the wines that I usually have. In the house, and also many, I also have many wines from Galicia. Okay, you know my wife is from Galicia in the northwest of Spain. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very particular area, you know. Yeah. For, for whites, the Albariño is the most yeah. wine there, yeah. and for reds, Men Mencia. That uh, I have the Abasujeira also, so that's the wines. I have a quite 
big variability. Toby, yeah. I need you have I need you have to open some borders, so you are invited to come whenever you want. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that. Okay, one final thing. There's um, Laura um, in the background. I think we have a poll, uh, a, a voting um, thing where you can vote for your favourite wine from from today. So oh, here we go. So do find your moment just to click on that. Just just for our own interests. Um, I know who Carlos will be voting for, but uh, you know, feel free to to put your poll. <laughs> um, okay. Well, I think that that about wraps it for, for us. Um, um, hopefully you all enjoyed the evening. I certainly have. I, I could probably you know, spend many more hours chatting with you, Carlos. Uh, to be honest, you know, we could, uh, yeah. Well, we have done in the past into the small hours. So um, thank you for thank you for giving your time to us, Carlos. It was it was a wonderful evening. And uh, here, the, here we go. Here's the results. There you go, Carlos. You've uh, <laughs> you've easily won these wines. Um, we they're all available to buy on the website. Uh, right now, should you so wish to, to make a purchase, um, you can buy them individually or as part of a case. Um, there's a, a, a Rioja Sauvignon pre-made case as well. So um, that, that's about it from us. Uh, thank you, everyone, for taking, taking your time to come and listen to me and Carlos talk. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you another time. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much.